Train rumbles. Door slides open. Come. Finally, doze off as the sun rises and the train pulls into the station.
fragrance of rain, of freshly placed stones, of newly sown grass. Thank you for joining us on this special occasion and a hello to those in the lobby and in the recital hall. Please join me in thanking once again our talented musical faculty, Mary Ellen Hopper and Deanna Cataldi. Your program mentions the musical piece was inspired by poems written by Sonia Larson. Sonia is a 2014 graduate of Viterbo University who recently completed a prestigious Fulbright Fellowship for additional study and research in Poland. Sonia is a remarkable woman who will receive the university's Young Alumna Award this fall. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the D.B. Reinhardt Institute for Ethics and Leadership. And over these years, a distinguished array of speakers, programs, publications and research has been made possible through the Institute. A special component of these programs, of course, is the opportunity for our university and our local community to welcome Holocaust survivors to La Crosse and to learn from them. These amazing women and men have captivated us. They have marched into our hearts and they never leave. Such will be the case tonight when we meet Magda Herzberger. This decade of programs and activities would not be possible without the generous benefactors who provided the initial support and continued support for the D.B. Reinhardt Institute for Ethics and Leadership. This institute is indeed a gift to the university and to our community. And we especially thank the Reinhardt family for endowing the institute. And we are grateful to other benefactors for your continued support. I also wish to acknowledge and thank Dr. Rick Kite, who holds the endowed professorship of the Institute for Rick's outstanding leadership and service these many years. Please join me in thanking Dr. Kite. <laughs> Our presentations by Holocaust survivors are the result of the tenacious dedication of Daryl Klott. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Holocaust educator and friend, Daryl Klott. Good evening. Before I begin, I want to announce that WKBT, our local Channel 8, will be broadcasting tonight's presentation on Sunday, April 17th at 10.35 p.m. Again, WKBT, Sunday, April 17th at 10.35 p.m. This year marks 11 years that Viterbo University, through the D.B. Reinhardt Institute, in leadership under the direction of Dr. Rick Kite, have been involved in Holocaust education. This includes our Holocaust Educators Workshop, and it's hard to believe that we are in the midst of number 10 today and tomorrow, and it is our largest one yet. We have nearly 80 people participating. I'm pretty sure that when Rick and I started the first one in 2007, we had no idea that we would still be running workshops in, in 2016, and I want you to know that we plan to continue. If you are involved either as a presenter or as a participant in our workshop, would you please stand up? I don't know where you are, but I know you're all there. Yeah. <laughs> Educators, I want to thank you for teaching your students what happens when people fail to accept other people's differences or they remain bystanders when they see an injustice occur. The other part of our Holocaust education program is to bring Holocaust speakers, mainly survivors, to our community. Magda will be our 16th Holocaust speaker, 
and our 14th survivor. Since many of you in the audience have been loyal followers of our program, I thought it would be fun to, to walk you down memory lane and see if you can remember these amazing people. We started in 2005 with Nessie Godin, and then Gerda Weissman Klein, 2006, and again in 2011, Sabina Zemering, Ellie Vazell, Henry Greenbaum, Deborah Lipstadt, Inga Auerbacher, Manya Friedman, Marty Weiss, Peter Fievel, Sam Harris, Sephora Katz, and last April, Otto Frank's stepdaughter, Eva Schlosch. And how about our own beloved Mary Rosted from Houston, Minnesota, who worked in the resistance against the Germans in Belgium. We have been truly blessed by the presence of all of these magnificent human beings as they have taught us lessons that we all need to learn. Many of you in the audience are familiar with the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration. For the past 138 years, since 1878, they and their prayer partners have been praying for prayer requests that come in from all over the world. The sisters are one of the Turbo's treasures, and I want to thank all of them for their prayers to keep Magda healthy so she could come to us tonight. Our survivors are always a little bit surprised when they hear that it's the sisters' prayers that have been keeping them healthy and not their doctors. <laughs> I am thrilled to see so many of you here tonight, for you are about to touch history. You will hear about the past from someone who lived it. The age of survivors is drawing to a close. Before long, no one will be left to say, I was there, I saw, I remember what happened. Soon we'll be left with videos and memoirs to learn the lessons of the Holocaust. I have been blessed to study with some of the most brilliant scholars, Holocaust scholars in the world, and they fill our minds with great, with brilliant facts. But Holocaust survivors fill our hearts. They teach us much more about history than any textbook can because they are living documents. Magda is an amazing woman. She is an accomplished author of 13 books. She's a composer and a poet. In her former years, she was a fencer, a downhill skier, a mountain climber, and in her spare time, she ran marathons. She's devoted her life to Holocaust education and helping other people understand that we are capable of overcoming the most difficult circumstances. Recently, Marv and I were in Austin, Texas, and we were fortunate to meet her publisher, Brad, and his wife. And Brad told me that Magda was his ticket to heaven. And I asked him what he meant by that. And he told me that when she was in Bergen-Belsen concentration camp toward the end of the war, April 1945, she was emaciated and starving, and she fell into a pile of corpses. People assumed she was dead. Then the British liberated uh, Bergen-Belsen, and a soldier noticed that she was breathing, and he picked her up, and as he carried her, she made a solemn vow to God that if he gave her a second chance and that she could live, she would keep alive the memory of the victims. And she's been doing that for 43 years. Brad said that when he gets to the pearly gates and St. Peter asks him, what have you done to gain entrance to heaven? He's going to say, I published Mag Magda Herberger's books. And Peter is going to say, welcome. And now, prepare to fall in love. It is my privilege to introduce my newest friend, Magda Herberger. my friends for this wonderful uh, reception. I hope I won't disappoint you. 
And, uh, um, and thank you, where is, where is Daryl? <laughs> she disappeared. Because Daryl, where are you? Wherever you are, I wanted to, uh, to thank you for this wonderful introduction. And you know, I am so well received here and so much love and everything, so much attention. We have wonderful uh, accommodations. My daughter came along with me and food, eating, eating. <laughs> and now I'm treated here like a princess. <laughs> and when I go home, I will tell my husband, you know, what I, what I get here. I want to be your princess now. <laughs> Maybe you have to fix from now on, at least for a week, all the meals. <laughs> then we will see what he says. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I want to ask you a question before I start everything. Do, I, do you think I look well enough for a 90-year-old woman? <laughs> I wanted to let you know, first of all, what is my age, you know. And I, uh, I hope I will have many more years to, to do my mission. And uh, lately, I had a conversation with God. And I said, oh God, I want to do so many more years what I'm doing. Please help me. I will ask you for 120 years to live. <laughs> and then I was thinking, well, you can be immodest with God. Ask for a little less. <laughs> so I, I will settle for 110. <laughs> And then I said, well, almighty God, I don't want to be modest. I settle for 100. But if possible, I still want 120. <laughs> so my friends, I was really looking forward to meet all of you wonderful people. I know there are here students and professors and faculty members and uh, guests. And uh, I would like to share with you uh, my experiences in the three German concentration camps. Uh, I survived three of them. And also uh, my life story, some of my poetry, and read to you two short excerpts from my autobiographical book for survival. But before all that, I would like to express my special gratitude and sincere gratitude to uh, where is she? Daryl. Daryl, aren't you here? <laughs> Where are you hiding? Oh, you are there. Good. At least I know where you are. So, uh, for uh, uh, Daryl made it possible for me to uh, come here as a speaker at the beautiful Viterbo University. Uh, and I came from, uh, um, from Fountain Hills, Arizona, to meet Alaska here. <laughs> that the, the snow, I didn't see snow there for a long time. For 20 years, we are in, in Fountain Hills, and I didn't see any snow. But um, uh, the winds were too bad. I didn't like that. Uh, and uh, also, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Daryl, for uh, organizing all my uh, program um, and uh, for all your work on publicity. Now I have to mention and say my special thanks to Marv Klott, who is, uh, he was wonderful. He, he was mobilized for me and my daughter. He was our driver and, and he was driving several times back and forth from the hotel in all different places. And uh, uh, I also appreciate the hospitality of uh, Marv and also of Daryl. I also extend my deep appreciations to the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration, who were playing for me for quite a few months. They were praying for my good health and safety so I can come here. And I know that some of the sisters are here so um, I think that God listened to your prayers 
because I am here and I feel pretty well. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I also want to express my, um, my special thanks to your wonderful president whom I met, um, Mr. Uh, Rick Artman, and then uh, also I would like to express my gratitude to, uh, to Mr. Rick uh, uh, Kite, who is uh, the director of ethics and leadership. And, uh, and then I, I express my gratitude to all of you who are coming here, who came here tonight to listen to me. And did I leave anything out, Daryl? Yes? yes? Do I have to mention somebody else? You have to help me, you know. <laughs> I don't want to. Be, I don't want to to be, uh, you know, ungrateful to anybody. <laughs> As a survivor of the Holocaust, oh yeah, I forgot something. <laughs> that is bad. I my daughter came along with me to take good care of me. <laughs> if I forget that, I'm going to suffer. <laughs> because you have no idea how, how she's, she's my guardian angel. She watches my every step worrying about me. And uh, where are you, Monica? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, you went so far. Her full name is Mrs. Monica Alice Wolfson. I mention that because she is a very fine artist. She is the illustrator of all my books. The very original cover and interior illustrations of my book were all created by my daughter. She is also a former opera singer with the Phoenix, Arizona Opera. And then I can't forget, where are you? I can see where you are, my very dear friend, where are you? Jennifer, Jennifer Weber. Uh, she, uh, we met with Jennifer three years ago. I had a presentation in Pittsburgh and she, um, she was present and then uh, she sent me a beautiful gift. She sent me a book with my quotations. She, she, she created that herself and her beautiful photography. So uh, I really, I really, it, it touched my heart. So she, she came along and uh, all the way to be here for a, four, a whole week. She didn't want to miss anything, what I'm doing. <laughs> As a survivor of the Holocaust, one of my very important missions in life is to keep alive the memory of the six million Jewish people and also the memory of all of the other victims of the Holocaust who were killed in the various German concentration camps during World War II. Many of my family members were among the victims, including my beloved father. My mother survived in a miraculous way. She passed away 20 years ago at age 93. I miss my mother. I, I wish she would be here, but I was fortunate that she was with us for so many years. But maybe she is here. Her spirit never dies, and maybe she's listening to me. Um, <clears throat> I am a survivor of three death camps. I call them death camps because I could have died every single day in each of them. Auschwitz-Birkenau, Bremen, Bergen-Belsen. At age 18, I was thrown from a wonderful, loving home environment. I was an only child, but my grandparents had 12 children. I had lots of cousins and uncles and, uncle and aunts. So from this nice home and wonderful, loving parents, I was thrown into an environment where love and compassion were dead where hatred, violence, and cruelty ruled instead, where I encountered the danger of being killed. 
on a daily basis, where death was marching wildly, striking the young and the old, beheading life on its cold scaffold, where I was an eyewitness to the horrible crimes committed daily by us, prison, to us prisoners. What kept me alive under those terrible circumstances was my deep faith and trust in Almighty God, my love for life and my family. It is important that we should keep alive the memory of all of the victims of the Holocaust. That is my mission for life, because I made a promise to God at the time of my liberation that I will always keep alive the memory of the, of the Holocaust victims. And when you make a promise to God, you can never break it. And my promise to God was that I will do that as long as I live. <laughs> The Holocaust should never be forgotten. I am very fortunate and I am very grateful to Almighty God for saving my life, for giving me another chance. And uh, the Holocaust victims should never be forgotten. And all the, all the, Victims of discrimination who were silenced forever should be honored, respected, and remembered. Sometimes people ask me, uh, how, how come that you remember so much? And my answer is, how can I ever forget? And now, this is my life story. I was born and raised in Romania, in the city of Cluj, which is the capital of Transylvania. Transylvania is a mountainous territory enclosed in the heart of Romania, surrounded by the north of the Carpathian Mountains and the south by the Transylvanian Alps and in the west by the Bihor Mountains. Transylvania changed uh, uh, hands in the course of time. Before World War I, it was a province in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. My uh, parents and even my grandparents and, and my great-grandparents were born and grew up in Transylvania. So what happened to Transylvania after World War I? Austro-Hungary was beaten and Romanians were joining in, in World War I the Allies. So the whole Transylvania was cut out from Hungary and given to Romania, including the city of Cluj, where I was born and raised. So when I was born, and I spell you out the year, you will think that I'm ancient, 1926. I was born in another century. And if you are born in the other century, you live through history, you see. And uh, so you see history repeating itself too. So um, what happened to Transylvania in 1940? When I was born in 1926, it was uh, Romania. But in 1940, Hitler wanted to attract Hungary in the war on his side. And uh, Hitler knew what he has to do to give a bait to Hungary. What was the bait? Transylvania. But he, he uh, forced Romania to give up northern parts of Transylvania and the city of Cluj, exactly on the place where we lived. And why didn't he force Romania to give up the whole Transylvania? Because in the city of Ploesh, they had oil. And Hitler did not want to be in too bad of a relationship with Romania. So now, in 1940, the Hungarians came in. 
Then what happened to Transylvania in 1944? Well, Hitler's war wasn't going very well anymore, and especially that he had uh, many losses on the Russian front in 1941, and the Hungarians had losses too. And so they decided they want to make a special peace treaty with the Allies. Hitler found that out, and he was uh, um, very angry at his satellite. And in order to prevent that, Germany occupied Hungary and then invaded also northern part of Transylvania and the city of Cluj, where we were living. You know, the city of Cluj was a very cosmopolitan city, very cultural city. It has the best schools, the best universities, the best opera houses and, and theaters. And uh, um, so, so, so now we, the Germans came in. But before the German occupation, uh, we experienced Jewish discrimination because the Romanian and the Hungarian governments in the mid and late thirties were very strongly drawn to Nazis and fascists. As a result of that, all kinds of anti-Jewish regulations were introduced. You know, my, the first one was the law of numerous clauses. And this was under the Romanians, remember. The, rumor, the law of numerous clauses affected me. I was at that time 11 years old. And uh, uh, I, love, I love to study. I wanted to get to the best uh, uh, Romanian high school. There were not called educational schools, boys' schools and, and girls' schools. And uh, in order, if you were Jewish, in order to be able to get into any of those schools, high schools, you had an exam, you have to score an almost perfect grade. So our biggest, our highest grade was 10, at least 9.6, preferable 9.8, that's what you have to score. And then you have to maintain that, because if you don't, you are not going to be able to, you were not able to continue your education. So I had to fight for my education. And I give you an example of how we were treated as Jewish students. Well, I did not realize at the time that I went to the high school that the, my best high school was the most anti-Semitic. All the teachers were anti-Semitic, including the principal. So the first day of school, every teacher asked us, Jews, stand up, Jews, stand up. And I was wondering why the Jews? So I found out that if a Romanian did now answer, the Jew was called. The Jew could not afford the bad grade. So we always were terrorized, you know? Oh, well, maybe I'm going to be asked. I hope, I hope I don't get a bad grade through, through my studies, you know? And I was determined not to give in to this fear. Um, the first day I came home from school, I was crying all the way. Why? First of all, I felt discriminated, and it was very painful to me. The second thing is, some of the students who had anti-Semitic parents, they greeted us with, with very degrading glimmerics, and they called us Jidan, which was a very derogatory thing, you know? And then started, picked up small stones, and threw, threw them after us. I went home crying and I asked my father, why do they do that to us? My father said, it's hard for me to explain why. I said, why are the Jewish people persecuted? And he said, but I give you good advice. Make sacrifice for the, for the sake of your studies. Like you make sacrifice for something that's important. Keep your mouth shut. Because if you are going to protest, you might be more persecuted or thrown out of school. And that was true. So, um, you know what helped me in 
really being fiercely um, uh, fighting for my grace, that uh, my, my uncle who was killed in the camps, he was a fencing, a Romanian fencing champion. And I, that he was my favorite uncle. And he did not have children of his own. So I was like his little girl too. And his little girl had to learn how to fence. So he taught me fencing when I was barely five years old. And, uh, uh, and he realized, which I didn't, I was so young, as I was after one, two years, three years, he realized that I inherited his talent. And uh, he encouraged me to be a competitive fencer at age 12. I faced only boys because girls didn't participate in that, in, in, in competition. So I came out first time a single girl. The boys were making fun of me and, and, and I didn't say a word. I thought, wait until you meet me <laughs> in the battle. And, and uh, uh, I want to see who's going to laugh, you know? And I had a method, I would say, to, uh, to fool them. <laughs> you know? uh, at the beginning, I pretended that I'm, I am, uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, defending myself, you know? And they said, oh, there's no big deal to beat her. But one thing they did know, I was very, very dedicated to the sport. And then I went on a wild and fierce uh, uh, charge, you know, and uh, they could not defend themselves. <laughs> so I was beating every single boy. <laughs> and when I came out the second time, they were so modest, they, they were very scared of me, you know, <laughs> with good reason. I had a passion. I was nine years old before I become a, a, a competitive fencer. And, uh, uh, I said, uh, my uncle asked me, do you want to become a champion like me? I said, yes, I want to become a champion. Then he said, don't complain to me that you have, uh, you have discomfort in your muscles. Don't tell me that you don't like to sweat so much, but you have to make an effort for that. And I promised, I said, I promise you, I am going to be a champion, fancy, a fencing champion. And I worked so hard. It's a very, very demanding sport. And it's, it's um, spiritual, I mean, uh, mental and physical, because you have to plan your moves. And at age, at age 15, I became fencing, junior fencing champion. My uncle was very proud of me. But it taught me something, you know, perseverance. You have to tolerate the pain. You have, to, you have to do everything that you can in order to be able to succeed. We don't have energy, we don't uh, gain anything without making an effort, an effort. And you have, to have, you have to put your whole self into it, you know. So that made me a fighter. So uh, it was really almost like a preparation for the, for the concentration camps. So, but I come back now to the Holocaust and what happened uh, after the Germans came in. Uh, you know, although we had discrimination, which uh,